That sound? That is the sound of an object breaking the sound barrier. In 1944, we knew that bullets could travel faster than sound. We knew that cannon shells could do it. But whenever we tried to push an airplane to that speed, 760 miles per hour, physics pushed back. The controls would freeze, the wings would shake violently, the plane would disintegrate. Scientists called it the compressibility wall. They said it was a physical limit, like the speed of light. They said if a man tried to cross it, he would be crushed. But one engineer at Wright Field ignored the scientists. He stopped looking at birds for inspiration, and he started looking at ballistics. He realised that if you want to survive the shockwave, you don't build a plane, you build a bullet, and you put a man inside it. To understand why Ezra Kotcher was a madman, you have to understand the aerodynamics of the death zone, Mach 0.8 to Mach 1. When a standard plane approaches the speed of sound, the air can't move out of the way fast enough. It compresses. It forms a shock wave, a literal wall of high pressure air that sits on the wing. This shock wave destroys the lift. It moves the center of pressure backwards. The pilot pulls back on the stick to pull up, but the plane pitches down. It's called the tuck. The harder you pull, the faster you dive into the ground. Before the X-1, pilots used dive flaps to disrupt these shockwaves. Do you know which World War II plane introduced them first? Ezra Kotcher was a lieutenant colonel, but really he was a professor of aeronautics. While the Bell Aircraft Company wanted to build a safe, jet-powered plane to inch towards the barrier, Kotcher said no. He argued that jet engines were useless. Why? Thermodynamics. A jet engine needs to suck in air to burn fuel, but at Mach 1, the shockwave acts like a plug. It blocks the air intake. The engine chokes. Kotcher laid out a terrifying requirement. We need a rocket engine. We need to carry our own oxygen. This changed everything. It meant the plane wasn't really an airplane anymore. It was a controlled bomb. The design he proposed was the X-1. Look at the shape. It has no sweeping curves. It has no intake scoops. Kotcher told the designers to take the shape of a 50 caliber machine gun bullet, which was known to be stable at supersonic speeds, and simply scale it up to the size of a fuselage. It was aerodynamic plagiarism. And it was brilliant. Then came the mechanics of the engine, the XLR-11. It burned a mixture of ethyl alcohol and liquid oxygen. The thermodynamics were a nightmare. The liquid oxygen was kept at minus 183 degrees Celsius. The combustion chamber burned at 2,500 degrees. The metal walls of the engine were only millimetres thick. If they got too hot, they would melt and the pilot would be vaporised. So, Kotcher and the team used the fuel itself to cool the engine. They circulated the freezing alcohol around the nozzle before injecting it to be burned. It was a delicate balance of freezing cold and hellish heat. Bell Aircraft agreed to build it, but they were terrified. The pilot they hired, Slick Goodlin, demanded a bonus of $150,000 million dollars today because he was certain he would die. He treated the X-1 like a death trap. He stole it tentatively. He wouldn't push the throttle. Ezra Kotcher was furious. He had built a machine to break history and it was being flown by a man who wanted a paycheck. The project stalled. The Army Air Force was losing patience. Kotcher needed a pilot who didn't care about the money. He needed a pilot who understood machinery instinctively. He found a 24-year-old World War II ace named Chuck Yeager. Yeager looked at the X-1. He looked at the rocket engine. He looked at the bullet shape. He didn't ask for a bonus. He just asked, does it have a key? But before they could light the candle, Kotcher had one final mechanical hurdle to solve. The tuck. Wind tunnel tests showed that even with the rocket engine, the elevator controls would lose authority at Mach 0.9. The air was too stiff. 
the pilot would be locked in a dive. Kotcher and the Bell engineers devised a mechanism that had never been used on a plane before, the all-moving tail. Instead of just flapping the little elevator on the back, they installed a powerful hydraulic actuator that moved the entire horizontal stabiliser. It was brute force mechanics. If the air wouldn't move, they would force the whole plane to bend to their will. The bullet was ready, the rocket was fueled, the pilot was reckless. But physics had one last surprise waiting for them, something that would happen at Mach 0.94 that nearly killed the program before it began. The X-1 had a major limitation. Its rocket engine was thirsty. It carried 2,000 kilograms of fuel, but the XLR-11 burned it so furiously that the tanks would run dry in just two and a half minutes. If the X-1 took off from a runway, it would run out of gas before it even reached the altitude where the air was thin enough to break the barrier. Ezra Kotcher's solution was simple mechanics. Don't take off. Be dropped. The procedure was terrifying. At 25,000 feet, Chuck Yeager had to climb out of the warm B-29, descend a ladder into the open airstream and squeeze into the frozen cockpit of the X-1. Once he was sealed in, the B-29 pilot would pull a lever. The X-1 would drop like a stone. Yeager had to wait for it to clear the bomber's propellers before lighting the rockets. If he lit them too early, he would crash into the mothership and kill everyone. Throughout late 1947, they inched closer to the demon. Mach 0.85, Mach 0.88, Mach 0.9. But at Mach 0.94, the crisis that Kotcher had predicted finally arrived. Jaeger was diving the plane. He pulled back on the control stick to level out. Nothing happened. The stick felt dead in his hand. The elevator, the flap on the tail that makes the plane go up and down, was useless. The shockwave had moved back and was shadowing the tail. The air was skipping right over the controls. Jaeger was falling out of the sky. But he remembered what the engineers, Kotcher and Jack Ridley, had told him. If the elevator fails, use the trim. This was the secret weapon, the all-moving tail. Jaeger stopped fighting the stick. Instead, he reached for a small trim wheel by his knee. This didn't move the flap, it tilted the entire horizontal stabilizer. He turned the wheel. The nose of the X-1 snapped up. The plane responded. Kotcher was right. Conventional mechanics had failed but his brute force engineering worked. They now knew they could steer through the barrier. The X-1 proved that all moving teals were necessary for supersonic flight. Why do you think most commercial airliners still don't use them? October 12th, two days before the attempt to hit Mach 1. The technology was ready. The physics was solved. So naturally, the human element tried to ruin it. Chuck Yeager decided to go for a night ride on a horse. He fell. He heard a crack. Two broken ribs. He was in agony. He couldn't lift his right arm. If he went to the hospital, the flight surgeon would grind him. The mission would be scrubbed. Kotcher's project would be delayed for months. Yeager didn't go to a doctor. He went to a local vet to get his ribs taped up. He told only one person, his flight engineer, Jack Ridley. Ridley looked at him and said, Chuck, if you can't lift your arm, how are you going to lock the door? This was a serious mechanical problem. The X-1 door didn't just shut, it had to be lowered into place and then locked with a heavy lever that required significant force to seal the cockpit against the vacuum of space. With a broken rib, Jaeger physically couldn't pull the lever. They were hours away from the most expensive, sophisticated flight in history, and the mission was about to be cancelled because of a door handle. Ridley grabbed a broomstick. He sawed off a 10-inch piece of the wooden handle. He climbed into the X-1 cockpit with Jaeger. Look, he said. He wedged the broomstick into the door handle to create a lever. 
Use your good arm, Ridley said. You push the stick, the leverage will lock the door. It was a solution that only a mechanic would love. Archimedes said, Give me a lever long enough, and I shall move the world. Ridley just needed a lever long enough to shut the door. October 14, 1947. The B-29 taxis onto the runway. The X-1 is frosted over with cold. Yeager climbs in, wincing in pain. He hides the broomstick in his flight jacket. He seals the door. He jams the stick in. Clunk. It locks. The mothership climbs to 20,000 feet. Yeager is sitting on top of 2,000 kilograms of explosive fuel. His ribs are throbbing. Kotcha is on the ground, listening to the radio. He doesn't know about the ribs. He only knows that today they are going to light all four chambers and not stop until the needle breaks or the plane does. The pilot pulls the release. The X-1 drops into the blinding sunlight. Yeager flicks the switches. Fire shoots out the back. The bullet begins to accelerate. Mark 0.9. Mark 0.95. Mark 0.98. The needle is shaking. The plane is buffeting. And then, the needle stops moving. October 14, 1947. Chuck Yeager is wrestling the beast. At Mach 0.98, the turbulence is severe. The plane is bucking like a bronco. The scientists had warned that this was the point of no return. They predicted that at Mach 1, the forces would tear the wings off. Jaeger grits his teeth against the pain of his broken ribs. He pushes the broomstick handle against the door to keep himself braced. He flips the final switch. All four rocket chambers are burning. And then... Something impossible happens. Silence. The shaking stops. The vibration vanishes. The control stick, which had been fighting him for the last ten minutes, suddenly feels smooth and responsive. Jaeger looks at the Mach meter. The needle has jumped off the scale. It reads Mach 1.06. 700 miles per hour. He has done it. He is flying faster than the speed of his own noise. Ezra Kotcher was right. The brick wall wasn't a wall at all. It was a hum. Once the plane punched through the shockwave, the air on the other side was smooth. The bullet shape sliced through the atmosphere perfectly. Jaeger famously radioed back to the ground, trying to be casual. Hey Ridley, that Mach meter is acting screwy. It just jumped off the scale. Ridley, watching the radar, knew exactly what had happened. I assume it's just a mechanical glitch, Ridley replied, playing along. But on the ground, they didn't need a radio to know what happened. A sound like thunder rolled across the desert. Boom. He was the first man-made sonic boom in history. The sound of the atmosphere being ripped open by a human being. Kotcher stood on the tarmac. He didn't cheer. He just said, the physics worked. The all-moving tail worked. The bullet worked. In a normal world, this would be front page news. But this was 1947. The Cold War had just begun. The US Air Force was terrified that the Soviets would learn about the all-moving tail, slapped a top secret stamp on the entire project. For months, nobody knew. Jaeger went back to the bar. Kotcher went back to his slide rule. The world had changed forever but it was a secret kept in a safe place at the Pentagon. It took months for the news to leak. When he did, Chuck Yeager became an instant celebrity, the man who broke the sound barrier. But the man who designed the bullet, Ezra Kotcher remained in the shadows. He wasn't a pilot, he wasn't a hero, he was just the engineer. But look at every fighter jet built after 1947, the F-86 Sabre, the F-15, the F-22 Raptor. Look at their tails. They don't have elevators. The whole tail moves. Look at their fuselages. They are slender, pointed, shaped to minimise the cross-section. They are all descendants of Ezra Kotcher's thought experiment. 
He proved that if you want to fly fast, you don't fight the air, you pierce it. Today, the Bell X-1 hangs in the Smithsonian, right next to the Spirit of St. Louis. It is a small, ugly, orange plane with a broomstick handle hidden inside the door. But it is the machine that taught humanity that the sky has no limit. They told Ezra Kotcher it was a wall. He proved it was just a door. You just needed the right key to open it.